The mission was named after uh, uh, perhaps the prototype of the cranky old man, uh, Galileo, uh, who, contrary to popular opinion, did not invent the telescope. He was smart enough that he read a description of a telescope, built his own, modified it, built a better one, and then invented modern observational astronomy, including discovery of four moons, four large moons, uh, we now know that it's uh, 60 plus, 65 plus moons orbiting Jupiter and uh, uh, helping to cement the Copernican revolution showing that Earth is not at the center of the universe. By the way, do you know what the center of the universe is? No, no, it's my cat, my cat's stomach. My cat's stomach, if you don't believe me, just ask him. Okay, and uh, discoveries uh, came quickly as telescopes got bigger. About 50 years after Galileo discovers the moons, uh, uh, Giovanni uh, uh, Schiaparelli, excuse me, uh, uh, Cassini, uh, discovers the great red spot of Jupiter, which is probably its most remarkable feature. And yes, this picture is upside down because that's what uh, uh, most telescopes did until uh, uh, relatively recent, uh, recently with uh, uh, more modern optics and also uh, with uh, imaging systems uh, where you simply flip it back right side up. So North Pole normally is at the, at the bottom of the image, so the great red spot is appearing in the southern hemisphere rather than northern, excuse me, the northern part of the image would appear to be north rather than at the bottom. Photography, one of the first pictures of the great red spot of Jupiter, 1879. And to put the Galileo mission into context, uh, these are the different spacecraft that have flown past Jupiter over the decades. Uh, and we'll review those in a moment, but I wanted to give you a sense of the size, in particular compared to an astronaut down there at the bottom of the image. So first past Jupiter were the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft uh, in 73 and 74. Uh, they used Jupiter for uh, uh, to execute high-speed turns and then to go on to sa explore Saturn. And uh, these spacecraft were spin stabilized. They were rotating the whole time, and that's part of how uh, they built up their images. Basically, uh, uh, as they went past the planet, the images were built up line by line as the camera scanned past the object or scanned over the object. The Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft in 79. Uh, this is uh, engineering mock-up that uh, uh, the National Air and Space Museum has now. Uh, and yes, that's Viger. Uh, and it was three axis stabilized, meaning that uh, uh, the entire spacecraft uh, would be pointed in whatever direction was necessary. And the large dish that you see, by the way, on these uh, those are the high gain antennas, and that helps focus the radio beam uh, so that most of the signal goes towards planet Earth rather than just being broadcast in all directions through space. So the Galileo mission started out as the Jupiter Orbiter slash probe. That was its uh, uh, original name back in the 1970s. And this was a combination of spin stabilized and three axis stabilized. So the lower part of the spacecraft was rotating, and the upper part of the spacecraft uh, was three axis stabilized, so no matter which direction the antenna and the instrument platform would be pointed, uh, the lower portion would rotate, and that's because uh, a number of uh, what, what are called field and particle instruments were mounted there. Uh, while we tend to think entirely of all the really neat photographs that come back from missions like that, and they're incredibly important uh, uh, for selling it to the public, to Congress, and for scientific purposes, a lot of the data that we get on these missions comes out of instruments that measure the uh, strengths of, uh, and directions of electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, charged particles, plasmas, uh, electrified uh, uh, gases in deep space. That tells us a lot more about what is going on and helps put things in context. Yes. that the bearings are extremely smooth. Hughes Aircraft has made really, really big bucks on uh, the uh, spin tables for various communication satellites, and that's really what this was based on. Uh, uh, they have a decent, they have a satellite drum with solar cells rotating, but then the antenna platform pointed towards Earth, communication satellites pointed towards Earth, 
is rotating use of these just made big big bucks manufacturing spacecraft that are spin stabilized but the antennas are constantly pointing straight down to earth they're very reliable they're built hundreds I would expect yes Jim Jim, Jim is the, right. Jim, Jim is my expert backup. <laughs> that, that, that's how, that, that's how Hubble Space Telescope is pointed. It's entirely with momentum wheels. It has no attitude control thruster, so you just torque those wheels in various directions and point the spacecraft exactly how you want. There's another question? Yeah, right. the momentum wheels and the three-axis stabilization you were talking about. Right. The main rotating body is this spacecraft. It's it, the mass. And, and right. the rotation, the right. plane of rotation is below this. So that, that's basically like a, a, a Pioneer Voyager type spacecraft bus up on top. And this is the, the uh, despun and spun section, and then there's the probe, which has not been mounted because it would be hidden up inside there. So this is during uh, uh, final assembly. And here's the original plan for launching it. Uh, uh, was going to deploy and launch it using a, uh, what was called the Centaur D. Uh, basically, the 10-foot diameter uh, uh, Centaur liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen rocket and we had the powered by two RL-10 rocket engines. We have one on display up on the third floor. Uh, you, you expand the, ox the hydrogen tank to 14-foot diameter, and you've got an incredibly powerful upper stage. They could just uh, kick that thing from Earth orbit on a trajectory straight up to Jupiter, and it would have gotten there in a couple of years, probably about a year and a half, two years. I forget what the, uh, uh, the, the uh, time duration was. That was the original plan. It was supposed to go, I believe it was in uh, March of 86. Uh, uh, they were going to do two, one for Galileo and one for the uh, Ulysses, the International Solar Polar Mission. Uh, as I said, March uh, or April 86, January 86, we lost Challenger. So the shuttle was grounded uh, at that point. Uh, all we could see is at least a year, maybe two to three years uh, before it's flying again. And as NASA takes, starts taking a really deep look at a host of safety issues, not just what happened with the boosters. They decide, you know what, it's really crazy sticking 30, 40,000 pounds of liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen inside the shuttle with the crew. We're not going to do that. So plan B that they came up with is to use what was known as the inertial upper stage. Uh, this was a uh, uh, two-stage solid rocket motor that would uh, it was designed originally to deploy the tracking and data relay satellites and others from the shuttle. Uh, so it's safer. The IUS had already been used. It's quite reliable. Uh, the downside is that it's not going to be anywhere near as fast as launching on the Centaur stage, so, uh, or near as energetic. So in order to make up the difference, we have to do three gravity assists. It flies by Earth twice past Venus. And it takes from launch in uh, October 1989 to December 1995. So that was a six-year odyssey, six-plus-year uh, six odyssey. And drawings like this can be kind of misleading. So here's an animation that gives you a better idea of what was going on. And for clarity, it just showed Venus, or excuse me, Earth in there. It didn't show the flybys of Venus. Notice that the purple line for Galileo doesn't stay exactly with Jupiter's orbit there. It moves just a little bit in there, in and out, and those represent the orbits 
that Galileo was taking around Jupiter, how far it got slung out on some of its orbits, which would last up to two and a half months. Um, made a couple of uh, quick flybys on the way out, the first flybys of asteroids. Uh, 951 Gaspra, uh, which is a little bit longer than Manhattan Island. It is a big, big asteroid, or really mid-sized asteroid. And then, big surprise, when it goes past Ida, discovers that Ida has a moonlet named Dactyl. And this is what it was supposed to look like when it arrived at Jupiter in 1995, but much, much earlier we discovered a major problem, which was a result of the Challenger disaster. Uh, the high gain antenna did not unfurl the way it was supposed to. It was kind of like an umbrella being stuck. And what had happened was uh, after it was, Galileo was already at the Cape, ready to be integrated uh, uh, on top of the Centaur and then loaded onto the shuttle when Challenger went down. Uh, and rather than just leaving it sit there, uh, they shipped it back to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and it sat there for the next few years. Now what happened was to save a few bucks, instead of sending it by airplane, because there's really no rush on this, NASA trucked it back. And what happened was with the vibration sitting in the truck, the lubricants for the antenna tips gradually worked out and effectively wound up with the ribs here, three of the ribs being cold welded in place. So they couldn't deploy it. Matt, they weren't worried about this. This is a highly reliable antenna. It had been used on the tracking and data relay satellites. Worked very effectively, popped out, worked great each time. Uh, uh, Fleet SATCOM, uh, Navy communication satellite used them. They're great. Why worry about them? They're reliable. Unintended consequences. That kind of a trip, that kind of back and forth and sitting in storage for a long time was something that had not been tested or qualified. So this was a, this was a rude surprise and NASA had to work out some uh, uh, really interesting, tough uh, uh, data compression techniques in order to salvage as many of the images as they did. So, oh, another hazard that, uh, uh, that we knew about and that was built into it but still caused problems with, uh, for Galileo was Jupiter's magnetosphere. It has an incredibly intense magnetic field. This was discovered by the Pioneer 10 and 11 spacecraft when they flew by. Uh, incredibly intense, and uh, as a result, the electronics for the Voyager spacecraft and then Galileo uh, and now Juno and any, anything else that's gone by had to be radiation hardened. Basically, it's pretty close to the electronics that you would use in uh, uh, military systems that might, have, might be expected to survive a nearby nuclear blast. Uh, Jupiter is a massive planet. Uh, has a, uh, a very strong dynamo that we don't fully understand at work in the interior. Produces a magnetic field that is so large that if you could see it from Earth, that's how big it would appear. And to put things in further context, uh, I'm just estimating here, uh, if Earth were there, the Moon's orbit would only stretch back and forth by about that much. So that's incredibly powerful. That means that there are lots of trapped charged particles zipping back and forth along those magnetic field lines, and they would hammer the electronics. And indeed, they did cause some problems. Uh, uh, they started to damage the light emitting diodes that were used for measuring part of the tape playback system. Yes, sir? Um, help me here, Jim. I'm, uh, the Jupiter is what, 12? Yeah. <laughs> That's the volume. So the volume is what? The magnetic field is about uh, 20,000 times stronger than that of Earth. Yeah. Yeah, so the diameter is what, about 12? Uh, the diameter is uh, just a little under 89,000 miles. Right, but I mean, uh, Earth radii. Uh, Earth units. Right. Right. So the Great Red Spot, you could easily, when it, when it was larger, the Great Red Spot could easily hold two or three Earths side to side. Yes. 
So that, that is incredibly powerful. So the electronics had to be hardened, and uh, they still wound up with some upsets and degradation of equipment. And they have to, uh, have to work around that or simply accept that you're not going to get as much data as what you wanted. Okay, so the other part, uh, I mentioned it was originally called Jupiter Orbiter Probe. Uh, the probe spacecraft, which was about uh, four and a half feet long, uh, was released from the Galileo spacecraft five months before encounter. So this is really accurate shooting. You just, th this thing had no active guidance system or control system uh, of its own. Uh, it could get itself oriented uh, to uh, uh, hit the atmosphere just right, but uh, it could not do any mid-course correction at the release. So this was really, really good shooting. If you want to graze into the atmosphere of Jupiter at just the right angle, don't want to go in too steep and crush and destroy it right away. You don't want to go in too shallow, skip out, and it just becomes another piece of space debris. And the re-entry cone, uh, the heat shield there, uh, was basically the same as the re-entry vehicles that are used for ballistic missiles. So this is much more dynamic, much more demanding entry than a ballistic missile would have. The uh, uh, peak temperature at the tip of the re-entry vehicle was hotter than the surface of the sun during the most dynamic part of entry. So there it comes in at a shallow angle, uh, probe entry, uh, uh, where uh, atmospheric pressure is about a 10 millionth what it is here. VAR is roughly uh, uh, one atmosphere pressure, at roughly the same as atmospheric pressure at sea level. So probe entry, uh, uh, 10 millionth, uh, and that, that seems pretty thin, but when you're going at uh, uh, over 50,000 miles an hour and hitting it, it can be pretty thick. Uh, Drogue parachute deploys to help slow and stabilize it. Uh, then the aft cover pops off and the main parachute comes out. Uh, and then for the next few minutes, uh, it's taking measurements as it descends through the atmosphere. So this is the first in situ, first on-site measurements that we had ever done of the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter uh, or any, uh, uh, any of the gas giants, uh, even, even the Cassini mission. Uh, uh, put its probe down on, started out as Saturn Orbiter and two probes, got scaled back, its probe landed on Titan, did not go into Saturn. Uh, so we had about uh, one hour of signal data, uh, 24 bars, that's equivalent to being about 700 feet underwater. That's how great the pressure was. The temperature uh, was extreme enough that it causes the probe to fail uh, and very quickly melts away the parachute, crushes the probe, melts the probe, so it became just aluminum and then titanium droplets eventually working their way down to whatever surface Jupiter has. And that's one of the mysteries about the planet. Uh, uh, this, this is an incredible, uh, uh, immense elaboration of the gas laws. So to go from uh, the beautiful cloud tops down through denser, hotter atmosphere, the gas temperatures go up, the pressures go up, but gradually, even, uh, even though the temperatures and pressures are really high, really because of the pressure, it turns from a gas to a liquid to a solid, and there's really no firm dividing line. It's not like going to the beach and you can see the surface of the water. So it just gradually changes. Okay, among other things that they, we explored, uh, Galileo collected a lot of information about the rings, uh, uh, and a lot of people are surprised to find out that uh, Jupiter has rings. These are not big, beautiful, picturesque rings, otherwise they would have been discovered by Earth-based telescopes earlier, uh, but they're dark and rather dusty, and it appears that they are made largely of material scattered off the four inner moons as they get hit by various meteorites uh, that are sucked in by Jupiter's gravity. That's an example of the clearing your orbit uh, part of the definition of a planet. Jupiter is a gravitational bully. So it kicks things out or pulls them in like Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 uh, colliding with Jupiter in 1994. So the anatomy, a lot of fine text is kind of hard to read, but it's a pretty picture. Uh, uh, very thin ring system. Uh, circulating great red spot, which uh, surprisingly tell is a monstrous storm that uh, appears to be weakening. So 
because it's conceivable that it could disappear we don't know entirely exactly what produced it what powers it so can't say exactly what its fate may be and here's the example of what I was talking about going from the outside inward gaseous hydrogen gradually becomes liquid hydrogen get helium and neon rain and then probably metallic hydrogen and here when we say metallic is really referring to how dense it is and how well it would conduct electricity and then it probably has a rocky core but we can't really be sure you know because we've not been able to put instruments down there that's part of what the Juno mission is doing it's largely exploring the the atmosphere now but it will help us understand the core simply by how Juno's orbit around Jupiter is altered by the gravitational field yes right no no it's about 90 miles 90 to 100 miles this we're talking this there's a depth of less than 100 miles that's how rapidly that pressure increases Onion skin. Yeah, it's like, like yeah, it's ap like about as thick as uh, like onion skin or apple skin. So Re relative to the diameter of the planet, yes. Yes, sir. They'd have to. Um. Uh, not the size really doesn't have anything to do with the velocity is what, what is important uh, it is impossible to have a solid ring system around any planet there's some, uh, something called a Roche limit French astronomer worked it out it's complex mathematics basically it means that the gravitational forces the tidal forces across the width of an object would be great enough that it would be shredded uh, uh, you, if you have a moon orbit too close to a body those tidal forces will just rip it apart. So the rings are made up of uh, uh, trillions upon trillions of dust particles. And, and they probably range in size. They, they probably clump up together, aggregate, then they run into each other, get shredded apart, clump up again, back and forth, back and forth, uh, constantly. Yes, sir. Not with the solar system, but with the equator of the planet. Okay, so that uh, uh, basically things would average out. There, there probably are some materials that orbit uh, out of plane. Not all of the moons are going to be in plane. Uh, but if you start running into stuff, uh, you either join the group or you get smashed to bits. Okay, one of the primary... Uh, uh, objectives of the mission was to explore the moon so this puts their sizes in context uh, and Ganymede by the way is bigger than Mercury so if it was orbiting the Sun on its own it would be counted as a planet it's large enough uh, of course if it was orbiting in closer to the planet uh, or excuse me closer to the Sun that probably wouldn't be a planet and I'll explain that in a moment so this gives you an idea of the relative sizes and in order to explore them, uh, Jupiter sort of system with 65 plus moons orbiting it and the rings. So there was a lot of interesting uh, uh, gravitational mechanics that went on in order to take advantage of the positions, the alignments of the spacecraft relative to Jupiter and different moons so it could fly past them to help reshape comes back in zips around Jupiter again you fly past another one and get a close-up look and then another one and then another one and this will give you an idea of what it's like I believe the 
body that is orbiting in reverse is its one of its outermost moons. And bam, end of mission. So we go back and show that again. So inbound, it's captured. So the sun is roughly towards the bottom of the frame. So Apogee, the high point of its orbit, uh, was almost always towards the sun so that you would have, we would have the uh, fully illuminated disk of Jupiter in view. So the other moons we talked about, I showed the, the four innermost moons and then the uh, Galilean moons we'll get to in a moment, but it has lots of smaller moons orbiting uh, many of them out of plane, uh, much farther out than the Galilean moons, uh, and I think three or four of them going in reverse, which indicates that they were captured by Jupiter. It's only uh, uh, Neptune, for example, has a Pluto-sized moon, Triton, that orbits in reverse. The only way that can happen is if it was a dwarf planet orbiting the sun on its own and it gets gravitationally captured, because you just can't stop a moon and then put it in reverse. Okay, the pizza planet as it's sometimes called, or the pizza moon. Io, uh, which is volcanic, constantly regurgitating across itself, resurfacing. And uh, the four Galilean moons are gravitationally stressed. They're squeezed from the inside out by tidal forces that warm them from the inside out. So we've got lava flows and active volcanism on the surface of Io. This is the first time we uh, observe volcanism on another world in our solar system. Uh, it was when the Voyager spacecraft went by. Uh, iron sulfide core, uh, if, if you're into volcanology, this, this is the place to go. This is the fun one. Uh, Europa, which has become one of the favorite spots to theorize about life elsewhere in our solar system because it has water. It has liquid water and uh, one of, the, one of the jokes, uh, uh, old, old joke in astronomy, is that the Nobel Prize is always just beyond the edge of the film plate, or just beyond the limit of resolution. If the picture was a little bigger, or a little sharper, I could have been a contender. Okay, so this is why you never throw data away. You hang on to it forever. Graduate students mining data from the Galileo mission discovered evidence that the Galileo spacecraft on one of its flybys of Europa passed through a water plume. Very, very thin, barely detectable, but it was there. So this helps confirm the findings from the Galileo spacecraft that uh, under the icy cap of Europa is liquid water, perhaps on the order of uh, anywhere from 60 to 100 miles deep. And it's made liquid again by tidal forces heating it from the inside out. And you wind up with sometimes plumes of water coming up through the ice cracks. It basically has ice tectonics going on on the surface. Uh, can't see below the ice. Galileo spacecraft could not see below the ice. But what it did was it measured the strength, going back to the Rigid instruments I talked about. It measured how the magnetic field was altered. The Jovian magnetic field was altered as it passed through Europa. Yes, sir. It's it's great, right. So uh, the orbits, none, none of these moons will be in a perfectly circular orbit. So uh, uh, as as they you know orbit a little closer, a little farther back and forth, uh, yes, gravitational forces, tidal forces. Uh, will change slightly, and that's going to flex the entire moon back and forth. And excuse me. And these four moons, and I believe probably the four inner ones, the smaller inner ones, are are tidally locked, just like our moon is. So one face is always towards Jupiter, and one face is always away from Jupiter. Pardon? Resident. resident that's right. They're in resident orbit. So basically, uh, for every two orbits that one would take, another one would take three orbits, and one would take one orbit. So they're, they're gravitationally bound to each other. Yes, but once per orbit. So 
you always have one face towards the central body. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're squeezed very gently back and forth, which, which Earth is, but to a very, very small degree by the moon. Very, very small degree. Okay, nice artistic representation of what those geysers might be like. So you've got water, you've got materials, you've got energy. Uh, chances are there might be life. Ganymede, another icy moon, which has been compared to a club sandwich because of the layers of material it has. Uh, uh, polar frost, hexagonal, salt water, different type of ice before you get down to the rocky surface. Uh, now, a word of caution, just because we've got a saltwater ocean doesn't mean that you're going to have life down at the bottom of the sea because the pressures down there are so extreme, the chemical reactions as we understand them would not take place. So if there's life, it's likely hanging on to the top of the ice shelf, or the bottom of the ice shelf at the top of the water column. And then Callisto, another club sandwich. And one of the things that uh, uh, the Galileo spacecraft found is that uh, these four moons have what are known as exospheres, very, very thin, tenuous atmospheres hugging very close to the surface. Then, of course, lots of photography, lots of neat images of the surface, excuse me, the uh, atmosphere. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I would do that, would, that made my late wife crazy was when we'd sit down in a restaurant, coffee would come, I'd stir the coffee and then I would drip the creamer into it very slowly and she'd tell me, quit playing with your food. And I said, I'm not playing, I'm doing physics. The swirling patterns are basically the same thing as what we're observing in the atmosphere here. There's, bulk, there's bulky atmospheric chemistry flows past different chemistry and the set up circulation patterns. Yes, sir. Excellent. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, first, this is a composite, not of the surface, but the cloud tops. We can't see the surface. We, e even if we didn't have the clouds, uh, the, the atmosphere is so dense that uh, uh, the light would be extinguished. So the only thing, if you were down on whatever surface or the surface of the ocean, the rocky surface, you'd have, probably have to do infrared imaging to see anything. Okay, this is enhanced. I'm not sure, I don't know if this includes infrared or not, but this is enhanced. Picasso said, art is a lie that makes us see the truth. This is very artful. Helps us see what is going on. Uh, an artist I know, Sarah Larkin, uh, in the 1970s worked with the Voyager imaging team to understand uh, what kind of enhancement was being done with the pictures. And this is before personal computers and Photoshop uh, understand what they were doing with the imagery. So she could back it out and do true color portraits. She painted true color portraits of Jupiter and Saturn. And they're very, very muted. Looking at it with our eyes, they're very muted as compared to the wonderful uh, press images that get released. But and, and scientific also because, again, these help us see the flow patterns. Help, they, they give us answers which in turn give us better questions to ask. And the Great Red Spot, which is starting to shrink a bit and uh, apparently the storm is abating, becoming less intense. But basically what you have there is uh, zones and bands flowing around the spot as it circles, as it rotates, rather. And you're asking about uh, uh, image enhancement. The pictures of uh, that Gal the cameras that Galileo used and all, all the modern cameras we use now uh, generally return monochromatic images, single color, but taken through a filter that takes out a very narrow slice of the spectrum. So that image, this image would be built up from three, maybe four or five different filters. And we assign different colors to them, generally corresponding to, to what our eyes perceive, and build up the color images. But this is the best, if you want to see you know, where things are densest, where most of the action is quite often, you'll work with the monochromatic images, the black and white images. So the end of mission for Galileo, into the atmosphere. Uh, did not want to contam run the risk of Galileo crashing on Europa or one of the other moons and contaminating it. The spacecraft was not sterilized. Uh, we, 
one tendency sometimes is to think in terms of what was done with the Viking 1 and 2 landers, which were literally autoclaved. They put a re-entry vehicle, and they autoclaved the darn thing so for, for like about three days at close to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. That was one reason why those spacecraft were, were so expensive, was that all the electronics, all the, uh, uh, the food for whatever bacteria, life forms that we might find on Mars, had to survive being autoclaved like that to avoid contamination. So the extreme measure, I believe, we only took that one time. We do take various steps to ensure spacecraft cleanliness, but uh, uh, one of the easiest things to do, in the case of uh, Galileo uh, and also the Cassini spacecraft, just slam it into the atmosphere. Uh, any bacteria left on that spacecraft are going to get burned up real fast, if not during entry, but also during that plunge into uh, the atmosphere and then ocean and surface of, Ju of Jupiter. If it's going to melt aluminum and titanium, bacterial life forms are not going to last very long. But the key thing is, it goes in there, it doesn't land on Europa or Callisto or Ganymede. Uh, the Dawn spacecraft, which is right now orbiting Ceres, is going to be cranked out so that it cannot collide and crash on Ceres because that's an icy body. It could conceivably have some rudimentary life forms. We don't know. We don't want to bias future results by having ancestors of spacecraft bacteria growing there and possibly eating up whatever natives might be there. A fun little sideshow to this is that the Galileo spacecraft was powered by uh, RTGs, radio isotope thermoelectric generators. Basically, they've got little plutonium ceramic buttons on them. The heat from that generates an electric current that powers the spacecraft. Well, you all remember the face on Mars? the alleged face on Mars, and the guy behind it, Richard Hoagland, well, he got all bent out of shape that we were going to drop Galileo into Jupiter, and he tried to petition NASA, get, get a public effort going on, not to do this because that plutonium, by golly, is going to spark a thermonuclear reaction and turn Jupiter into a star. Right. Okay, so other spacecraft exploring Jupiter, uh, the Cassini, Saturn Orbiter and the New Horizons spacecraft uh, used Jupiter for gravitational assist. Uh, Cassini to sling it on its way out to Saturn and New Horizons so that it would reach uh, Pluto about 10 years faster than it otherwise would have done if it had been a straight ascent from Earth. And right now the Juno spacecraft is uh, orbiting Jupiter. Uh, notice it's solar powered. And this is an example of the advances that have been made in both in the efficiency of photovoltaic arrays, solar cells, and low-power electronics. They can do a lot more than what was done with the Pioneer spacecraft. And here's a neat example. What a difference four decades makes. So on the left, that's Pioneer 10's view of Jupiter. Again, built with the spacecraft spinning and the camera building up the image line by line as it scans past Jupiter which is why some of the images will actually have little color mismatches because Jupiter has rotated and the spacecraft has moved just a bit while the image is being made. And on the right, that is a recent image from, I believe, the South Pole of Jupiter taken by Juno. And if you think that looks incredibly detailed, the close-up images that it takes are just phenomenal. Okay, so for the future, uh, Europa Clipper, uh, would not orbit Europa, but it would orbit Jupiter, and its trajectory would be shaped so it would do multiple flybys, blow out the two flybys of Europa, try, not looking for life, but measuring the conditions to help us determine whether life, uh, the likelihood of finding life there. Uh, Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, European Space Agency, has a similar mission in mind, but of course, landing there could be a little bit dicey. That's from the movie 2010, the year we make contact, for those of you who may have missed it. Okay, questions? That's where I stole the images. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Galileo was inbound to Jupiter at that time. It did observe it, but not in as much uh, uh, detail as Hubble and uh, various ground-based observatories here did. If if Galileo had gone off on time in 1986, yes, it would have been there when Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit. 
and then and the data hall from that would have been phenomenal especially if the high gain antenna was properly deployed but you uh, Galileo was still inbound and still several months out at that point yes sir Uh, okay, that's a good question. First off, bacteria can go into uh, uh, dormant mode, basically like a spore, and, and can last in the ground without food for long, long periods of time. We can't just think in terms of how our metabolism works. Uh, uh, I had a donut. I need to have another one after the talk. Uh, need to have lunch later, et cetera, the way we eat. Bacteria have, have quite different metabolisms, and they can, they can just lie dormant for long periods of time. Now, how long they could last in the vacuum of space, that's another question. So we brought back, uh, and the one everybody talks about is the Surveyor 3 camera that the Apollo 12 crew brought back in 1969. Uh, and there was a great deal of excitement. Wow, there's a uh, uh, viable Staphylococcus on the back of the mirror. It's been sitting up there on, there on the moon for over two years and it's still viable. Uh, no, it was like, achoo, swap, swap. <laughs> That's literally what happened. That was literally what happened. Yes, sir. No, sir. If if man, if if we had that, that would be the scientific discovery of the century. Uh, if you know, if we found it to prove that it was extraterrestrial in origin. Uh, we brought back uh, specimens of uh, the solar wind uh, and uh, so on, but in, in lunar samples. Uh, and I'm missing one here, Jim. There was Stardust and Genesis. Stardust and Genesis. Right. And one of the best places to look for meteorites is down at the South Pole on frozen lakes because you find a rock sitting on top of the lake that had to fall from the sky. So, uh, or out in deserts, out in the Sahara. Um, but uh, we, we found organics, organic compounds, which is not the same as finding life. And one of the theories is that life on Earth may have been seeded because as hot as it was, the planet would have been sterilized and then we would have been seeded with organics that had just naturally non-life formation in space and got dropped on Earth. That's a possibility. But nothing, uh, a lot of people believe that, that there is life on Mars or Europa or that we've got proof, evidence, et cetera. No, nothing. Lots of tantalizing hints that conditions are right, that the chemicals are out there. But you know, nobody's standing in front of a camera saying hi, even at, at a microscopic level. Well, no, it's, it's, it is not a search for life. It is a search to understand how these worlds formed uh, because the formation of Jupiter and the other uh, planets in the solar system influenced in various ways that we don't fully understand the formation of Earth. And in many ways, uh, we're really starting to learn the right questions to ask. Okay, science, science is not about the answer itself, but it's how you formulate the question. And a lot of the questions we've just started to learn how to ask in the last 20, 30, 40 years, especially as regards, uh, to digress a little bit, uh, humans in space, which is the, the incredible value the space station has. Uh, the formation of the solar system, uh, uh, fundamental cosmology, how do you build a planetary system? And yes, how, where life comes from, origins, is a very important part of that. It's an important part of uh, NASA's planetary mission. But the program does not hang everything on that one hook on looking for life. It's just one of many aspects of it. Uh, you want to find out what are the conditions there? How did this form? What is the chemical makeup? One of the things that Galileo, uh, the Galileo probe found is that they didn't go through three decks 
of clouds the way we expected. It was one larger deck with scattered clouds down below. The helium content is much lower than we thought. The wind structure was different. The temperature rose faster. So we have neat theories and we have neat computer models, but at one, some point you've got to go out and put your finger in the river and measure how fast the current is and how cold it is and at what depth and so on. Then you build new computer models, you refine your questions and you go out and you find out, well, wow, this is wrong also or it's different from what I expected and refine them some more. So it's an iterative process. We're constantly asking questions, refining questions, asking new questions, but learning a lot in the meantime. And as I said, the wondrous pictures that we get are really, really neat, but the real discoveries are when you're sitting there, what the heck is that? Looking at the graphs, measuring the chemical content, the temperatures, the pressures, wind velocities, et cetera. Uh, that gradually give you more insight into how that world is built and in turn helps us understand more about our home world. And it just, a big part of it is just satisfies our curiosity. What the heck is going on out there? Excuse me a second. Jim, Jim is an avid amateur astronomer and also a NASA Solar System Ambassador. If I take you to the hospital and run you through full body MRI and CT, I'm going to learn a lot about how a human body is built, but I'm not going to learn how the human race is built. That, that's, that's, that's part of how it works. to planetology, very important aspect. That, that's always thrown in. I want to find out, you know, this about Jupiter, that about Jupiter. And oh, by the way, uh, or maybe even the second one, you know, I can compare what's going on here with what's happening on Earth. Ganymede, for example, uh, the only moon I believe that we know of that has its own inherent magnetic field. Not that it's altering the magnetic field, uh, jo the Jovian magnetic field around it, like the other moons do, but it has its own inherent magnetic field. That, was, that was a neat discovery by itself. Oh, yes, sir.
Oh, the, um, nothing in the universe is static. Nothing is absolute except the speed of light. Experimental observations, yes. Right, right, but see, observing how they change, because the, the Jovian magnetic field will change, it will, it will uh, change very slightly in response to the solar wind. How that responds as compared to how our own magnetic field responds in response to the solar wind is a good comparison, because the Jovian magnetic field, as I showed, is really immense, and by the time you get out that far from the sun, the solar, magne the, uh, solar wind is much weaker, although, one of, the, one of the events that uh, uh, caused a problem on the Galileo spacecraft was the uh, year 2000 Bastille Day coronal mass ejection. So this is a major solar storm, hammered a number of satellites here in Earth orbit, but it's still strong enough that when it got to Jupiter, it caused some disruptions on the Galileo spacecraft. Well, we could move it, but you'd have, what you'd have to do is tweak an asteroid so that it flies past Earth, and then that series of flybys actually cause a series of gravitational assists that could gradually crank Earth out. Someone worked that out about 15 years ago, because the sun is gradually becoming more luminous as it gets older, and if you thought it was hot this summer, wait for about another half billion, billion years. It's, it's going to be this place to be toast. But somebody said, hey, you know, we could actually gradually crank so, you know, maybe, you know, start doing that in about 10 million years, maybe then we could work out the politics of funding the space program. Might take that long. Kathy, who's next? Well, I'm doing all sorts of stuff next. Um, Would you like to buy a vowel? Front classroom. It's going to be chemistry. It's going to be kitchen chemistry. Now that we've cleaned up the mess from the last one. Feel free to join in. Thank you. 
careful which bus you pick. You'll have to listen to me again. There you go. Okay. So I'm just saying, you know, so don't make sure you have vowels down there. <laughs> 